So this is the antimatter video. Antimatter. Antimatter. It's fine. The first thing I want to say is that, yeah, it's a terrible name. Antimatter as like a word evokes like this, but antimatter and matter are the same thing. Like they're made the same way. They interact with each other the same way. They interact with the forces the same way. If you took every piece of matter in the galaxy and replaced it with it like its antimatter counterpart, you wouldn't even notice. It would be identical. I mean, electricity would go backwards, but that's just like a naming convention. I think that leads to confusion. So today we'll be talking about antimatter and I hope to, to go through some more of these confusing things about it. Here's a table of contents if you wanna jump around. This is the antimatter video. So you know the standard model of a very successful theory of physics? You have all these particles and there are so many and they have so many names like fermions and bosons and leptons and mesons and hadrons and I'm not gonna get into all that, but you should know that every single one of these particles has an antimatter counterpart that you could put over here. I wanna specifically talk about protons and antiprotons, electrons and anti-electrons, which are sometimes called positrons, but I think that's confusing when that's the only one that has a name that's not just anti, whatever, and photons. And the antiparticle for photons is a photon. If you look at the electron and the anti-electron, an electron is just a subatomic particle. It has a certain mass and a certain spin and all of these quantum numbers, and it has a negative charge. An anti-electron has the same mass. It can have the same type of spin, and it has a positive charge. A proton, though, is a composite particle, right? Protons are made up of valence quarks, um, a sea of quarks, and gluons. So if you were to draw a schematic of a proton where you include the composite particles, you would see two up quarks and a down quark like this. And you might think, oh, an antiproton will be two downs and an up, but no, no. <laughs> No, no, an antiproton, if you draw it with its composite particles, is two anti-ups and an anti-down. Yep, there are anti-quarks. We're not gonna get into QCD, but quarks have colors and you have to conserve color, just like you have to conserve charge. And so you see that these are red and green and stuff. The anti-quarks are not red and green, they're anti-red and anti-green. Everything has an anti. It's fine. That's that's what's happening. A photon is its own antiparticle. Great. Now I would like to talk about how antimatter was discovered theoretically within the standard model, but I am not going to do quantum mechanics again because I did that a few videos ago and I told you I will do the easiest problem there is and it took me like 45 minutes and I didn't even finish it. So instead, I'm gonna do the physics thing where I kind of illustrate for you how this happened. This is the work of Paul Dirac, a very famous physicist who is responsible for the discovery of antimatter. So we are gonna do a kinematics problem, a very simple physics problem in order to illustrate why antimatter exists and why it has to exist according to quantum mechanics and the standard model. It'll make sense, I promise. Okay, so imagine you're standing on a cliff and you throw a ball straight down over the side of the cliff and the height from your hand to the ground is 30 meters. And I want you to figure out the time it takes T for that ball to strike the ground. So let's do it. I'm gonna draw the picture first. So here's you and your arm is throwing a ball over a cliff and this distance is 30 meters. I'm going to call this position here y equals zero, which means the ground is located at y equals minus 30 meters, which means that initial velocity that you've thrown the ball down with is eight meters per second is going to be negative eight meters per second. And we also know the acceleration at this point is going to be minus 10 meters per second squared. And what we want to solve is what t is at this position. Okay, so let's do that. Let's write down our kinematic equation. Delta Y equals V naught times T plus one half AT squared, 
we can fill in minus 30 meters is equal to minus 8 meters per second t. Uh, one half of 10 is 5, so that's minus 5 meters per second squared t squared. If we rearrange this, we just get the quadratic formula. So we have 0 is equal to minus 5 t squared minus 8 t plus 30. Uh, so you can do the quadratic formula where t is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a where minus 5 is a minus 8 is b and c is 30. So if you plug this into a calculator you get two answers right because of that little plus or minus. So t is equal to minus 3.4 seconds or t is equal to 1.8 seconds. Now, this shows us the limit of mathematical models in physics. We set up this problem according to like Newtonian dynamics and it gives us two answers, but only one of those answers is right, right? You can't have negative 3.4 seconds. You threw a ball down, there is no way it took negative time to get there. Negative time doesn't exist. You can't go back in time actually. So this is just wrong, wrong, wrong. So physicists call this boundary conditions. Like we know that you started the problem at t equals zero. There's no way you went back in time. There's only one answer here. And the answer is 1.8 seconds. And yeah, you could work out what this answer means in the mathematical model, which is usually like, if that rock, instead of being thrown down, was on a parabolic path, if you go back 3.4 seconds, that's when it was at the same height. It doesn't matter because it's the wrong answer. This is the limit of mathematical models in physics. You have to really know the physics of your problem. You have to know the boundary conditions. You can't just do the math because you can't go back in time. There's no negative time. Okay, what does this have to do with antimatter? Imagine you're a quantum mechanic in the mid 1920s and you're wearing your overalls, you're covered in grease, you've had a really hard job at the shop all day doing this giant quantum mechanics problem. And you're almost done because you got two answers. One of those answers was something that looks like the mass of an electron, so an M E going this way, and something else that looks like the mass of an electron going this way. But you know which way your magnetic field is going. You're going to impose the boundary conditions. And you're like, this particle, if it's going to travel in this direction, it has to have a charge of plus one. And this particle, if it's going to travel in this direction, it's going to have to have a charge of minus one. And you say, ha ha, I know that electrons have a charge of minus one. So this is our garbage answer. We can throw that away. That particle doesn't exist. The only particle that exists is the electron with a charge of minus one. The only particle that exists with the mass of the electron and has a, has a negative one charge. So it has to be this answer. I've done it, boundary conditions, I did physics. But then in 1928, well, Dirac's 1928 paper is wrong and he talked to a bunch of people and corrected it. And so let's, let's instead talk about his 1935 paper. In his 1935 paper, Dirac is like, guys, I don't think we can throw away this mass of the electron plus one charge particle. Who says this particle doesn't exist? Like, we can't just throw this away. How do you know it doesn't exist? So he says, you can't apply that boundary condition. Just because we don't know yet that that particle exists doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Why can't there be a particle with the same mass as the electron, but the opposite charge of the electron? Maybe it's, an, it's a positron, an anti-electron. Maybe that exists. They, they found the anti-electrons. And it turns out in their experiments, physicists had been seeing anti-electrons this whole time. What they would see is a track in like a cloud chamber or something. And from the radius of that track, you can calculate the mass of that particle. And from its direction, if you know the magnetic field, you can calculate its charge. So they had been seeing these anti-electrons all the time, but they were just assuming that, oh, a rogue electron was traveling through this experiment. And that has nothing to do with the interaction we wanted to look at because that electron wasn't related to this. We can tell because it's not moving in the right way. 
And Dirac was like, guys, if you had even for a second thought about the statistical likelihood of just electrons just flowing through your boxes all the time going the wrong way, you would have realized that that was actually happening in the interaction. But anyway, that's, that's antimatter. It has to exist because the standard model allows for it. It has to exist because quantum mechanics allows for it. And now we see those particles all the time. Okay, so my little kinematics example was supposed to show you that there are limits to mathematical models. You have to know the physics of your problem. You have to know the boundary conditions and you can rule out erroneous answers. Like just because the math works doesn't mean there's like physics applications of the math. I've actually done a video about that before. But sometimes you learn from your mathematical models that something could be there. And just because you haven't observed it yet doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so that's what Dirac did. And he opened up the world of antiparticles. So I mentioned earlier that antiparticles are matter, just like matter is matter. Uh, we see them being made in cosmic ray collisions. Like if you, I don't know, slam a bunch of energy together to make particles. And one of those particles you make is a proton and it has the mass of a proton and it has the charge of a proton and it is a baryon like a proton. So it has a baryon number of plus one. You also have to make the opposite of that in order to conserve charge. So you need to make a particle that has a charge minus one so that the total charge from that interaction is zero, right? You have the proton plus one, you have the antiproton minus one together, that's zero. And the antiproton has a baryon number of minus one. So you have a plus one and a minus one, you get zero. This pair production is how we expect antiparticles to be made, which, which kind of leads to a problem right? If you think about the Big Bang, you go back in time, the universe is very, very small. And there's this giant explosion where everything is made all at once. According to the rules of quantum mechanics, you have to have conservation. So you have to have pair production, which means that for every proton you made in the Big Bang, you had to make an antiproton. And the thing about antimatter, and the thing about antimatter, which I haven't discussed, which you probably know is the, the most important quality of antimatter, probably explains why it's called antimatter evoking this, is that when you take a proton and an antiproton and you put them together, they annihilate. Now annihilate is a very specific word in physics. People use it colloquially, like if you're playing a sport against a team and you beat them at the sport because you're really good at sports. Sport you could say like, we annihilated the other team, but that's not what it means in physics. In physics, it means very specifically that you have a collision where two things interact, and as a result of the collision, the two initial things are completely gone. They do not exist in the universe anymore. So a proton and an antiproton, when they collide, release a bunch of energy, they make a bunch of new subatomic particles, but the protons are gone. They do not come back. They are annihilated. That's what that means. So, so let me say about the start of the universe. Again, you have this big explosion of energy, right? We know from quantum mechanics rules that you make particles in matter-antimatter pairs, which means the Big Bang for every proton made an antiproton. But remember, the universe is still very, very small at this time. So you make all these protons and antiproton pairs, all of those particles should just immediately find an antiparticle because they're attracted due to the electromagnetic force, right? One's a positive charge, one's a negative charge. They're going to pull together and they're going to explode and annihilate immediately. So, so why are there any protons left at all? Why does matter still exist? How did that happen? This is an open problem in physics. I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry, that's really disappointing, right? What happened probably was you had the Big Bang, a whole bunch of mass was made and a whole bunch of anti-mass was made and the huge majority of the mass and the anti-mass slammed together and annihilated, but for some reason there was an asymmetry. For some reason there was a little bit of baryons left over and all of those little bit of baryons formed all the galaxies and all the humans and all the things you know and touch and love. How? 
why, what caused the asymmetry, why, why was it matter instead of antimatter? Is it does it matter? <laughs> does it matter that it was matter instead of antimatter? I don't think so. Just like the way we chose north being north, it doesn't really matter if all of a sudden we just decided to call that south. We could call all the matter antimatter and the antimatter matter, and it wouldn't make a difference. Would it? Why did the matter survive and the antimatter not survive? Open question. That's why we study antimatter. Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons why. The other reason is that it's cool. But if we learn about antimatter, we can learn about the start of our universe. We can learn about cosmology. Because what if what if we did make an anti-helium, you know, two anti-protons, two anti-neutrons, and two anti-electrons, and it didn't behave like a helium? What if it was like a little bit different? That difference could help explain the symmetry breaking at the start of the universe. It could explain why matter won over antimatter. I was talking about the hydrogen atom the other day, and I was like, look at these energy levels. When you have an electron at this energy level, it wants to go back down and it emits a photon of a very specific wavelength. And we can look at the spectra of those photons and know exactly what molecule we're looking at. Anti-hydrogen should have the exact same energy levels. So we can make an anti-hydrogen. And what if instead of having a binding energy of minus 13.6 EV, the anti-hydrogen had a binding energy of minus 13.41 EV. Wouldn't that be crazy? Then we could learn about cosmology. Finally, we would have answers, but it turns out like it behaves exactly the same, which is kind of what we predicted with quantum mechanics. So, but it would be cool if it didn't. What if you made an anti-carbon and the bonds were stronger or something and you could be like, the aliens will be anti-carbon. <laughs> So we know that most of the antimatter is gone, but antimatter is still made in normal everyday interactions the same way matter is still made in normal everyday interactions. Uh, one of the ways is through cosmic rays, just like interacting with the atmosphere. You can make it an electron and an anti-electron and you can see those in your detectors. Another way is through radioactive decay. So things like potassium, have these decay channels that will produce antimatter. Your, your body produces antimatter every day all the time. The bananas on your counter, you've heard that bananas are radioactive, right? They have a bunch of potassium. One version of potassium is radioactive. It just emits a bunch of radiation and some of that is antimatter. Neat. But physicists want to study antimatter, of course, to learn about cosmology and all that other stuff also because it's cool. And because of that, we want to make antimatter. We want to make stuff that's bigger than like an anti-electron. And to do that, we need particle accelerators. Because in collisions, as I've been hinting at this whole time, you make pair production. If you make a proton, you have to make an anti-proton. So what if you did that a bunch of times? You got a big old stockpile of anti-protons. And anti-protons are just hydrogen, no, anti-hydrogen ions. And then you got an anti-hydrogen ion gas and you could study it. Wouldn't that be cool? So let's talk about CERN. I don't know why I always say CERN. There are so many different accelerators. Is CERN just the most famous one? All right. So I think I mentioned earlier that you can do pair production as a result of collisions. Like if you throw particles together, a bunch of crap comes out and you can study that crap to learn about the world. So if you take two protons and you slam them together, one of the interactions results in pion production. And the pion is a subatomic particle that's like two quarks bound together. They're relatively low mass. The mass of the proton is 938 MeV and a neutral pion has a mass of 135 MeV while a charged pion has a mass of 140 MeV. So these are relatively low mass comparatively. So these reactions are like proton plus proton yields proton plus proton plus pion. So the way these guys work is you have like a stationary target. And if you want to do a proton-proton collision, your target has to be made of protons. Usually you just have like a stationary hydrogen gas. So like you don't care about electrons, like electrons are garbage, they're so small. Your proton's huge, it's gonna slam into another huge proton. 
the electrons don't even matter. So that's stationary. And if you want something to come out of this collision, you have to give energy to your proton beam that's gonna slam into these stationary protons. So you might think like, okay, if proton plus proton yields proton plus proton plus pion, you just have to give that beam of protons 135 MeV. You give it enough energy to flip it into this other stationary proton and they'll stop, you know, and out comes your pion. But no, not actually. Have I mentioned that conservation rules all? Uh, you have to have momentum conservation. So if this guy is stationary, but you're slamming a moving beam of protons into it, there's momentum in this interaction, which means there has to be momentum after. So you have to give your proton beam much more than 135 MeV to get a 135 MeV particle out. Let's do the math. So let's go to the lab frame where you have a proton beam moving with some velocity V and it's gonna slam into a proton that is stationary. This is our initial condition and there is momentum here, right? You have the mass of the proton times the velocity of the proton. So imagine you gave this proton that's moving 135 MeV. So that's its kinetic energy. It's gonna slam into the stationary proton and you want all of that kinetic energy to be turned into a pion. So your end result would be two protons and then your pi zero just hanging out. Except this doesn't conserve momentum, right? Because you have momentum here. If all these are stationary, if every bit of that kinetic energy got turned into this mass, you have no momentum. That, that breaks conservation, which is the biggest rule in the universe. You have to conserve everything all the time. So instead, you need to give this moving proton more energy. It has to have more than 135 MeV. Let's calculate how much that is. Okay. So let's go to the center of mass frame where your proton is moving this way and the proton that was stationary is moving this way, okay? Here, in this situation, momentum is zero because you have an equal velocity going both ways, they cancel out, which means after our momentum can also be zero. So now let's look at conservation of energy. If at the end of this, we produce a pion in addition to our two protons, this whole situation will have some energy and it has to be equal to whatever the energy was over here. So when we're looking at our initial energy, we're gonna have to account for the relativistic Lorentz factor. And on the right hand side, after this collision, we're just gonna have the rest energies of the particles. So that's gonna be two mp c squared plus m pi c squared. Let me just plug in gamma. So mp c squared over one minus v squared over c squared. And all of these are known values, like we know the mass of the proton, we know the mass of our pion, we know what C is. What we can do is solve for V in the center of mass frame, and what we get is that that is equal to 0.36 C, which is very fast. But we need the velocity in the lab frame, right? Because remember, we're shooting a beam of protons at stationary protons, so the proton that's moving is going to have to have two times v center of mass. And when you're adding relativistic velocities, you can't just say 0.36 plus 0.36. You have to do the special relativity formula. So let's do that. So v lab is going to be equal to v plus u over 1 plus v u over c squared. Um, here v and u are equal to 0.36, so when you work this out you get that v in the lab frame is 0.64 c. So if you want to make a pi zero in your collision, your initial proton has to be traveling at 0.64 c, which is why they make these giant accelerators. You have to get these protons up to relativistic speeds in order to start making stuff. 
And I, I think it's easier to think about this in terms of energy. So the energy of that initial proton is going to have to be gamma minus 1. We know this is 938 MeV. So the energy that you're adding into the proton is going to be 280 MeV. What this means is in order to make a particle that has a mass of 140 MeV, you need to put at least 280, probably more than that, 290 MeV into your proton. So this is called the threshold energy. You have to add enough energy to conserve momentum in order to make the mass. So you're making a very tiny particle, you have to put double the amount of energy into your proton in order to get that particle out. This is super inefficient. <laughs> you have to double the energy you add to the proton beam in order to make these teeny tiny particles. But they're not in it for like efficiency. They're not trying to conserve energy here. They're trying to study those particles. So you have to do that the only way you know how, which is to make them in an accelerator. But what if you want to make antimatter? What if instead you want your proton-proton collision to produce a proton-antiproton pair? You have to put a lot more energy in. Instead of doing the proton plus proton yields proton plus proton plus pi zero, you want to do proton plus proton yields proton plus proton plus a proton-antiproton pair. So plus proton plus p bar. This looks weird, right? Proton plus proton yields three proton plus an antiproton, but, but that's how particle physics works. The math is mathing for us right now. Um, of course, that means you're going to have to add in the energy of these two masses plus more, plus the threshold energy to get that out. It's going to be incredibly expensive. So you might say, like, well, if we just have to conserve charge, why can't we do something like this? Because now this has a plus one charge, this has a minus one charge, and you're conserving charge. But you also have to conserve baryon number. This is not a baryon. This has a baryon number of minus one. If this interaction happened, it would break our rules of conservation, which are immortal and the most important. They're the gods of us. So we can't do this. This would never happen. It breaks all the rules. So even though this would be a lower energy interaction because this particle weighs way less than the proton, you can't make this. This would not work. So you can't do this guy. You have to put in enough energy to make the proton-antiproton pair. So let's calculate the threshold energy for the proton. And we can do the same like lab frame, center of mass frame, Lorentz invariance trick that we used before. So in the center of rest spring, after the interaction, which is like where you have E of proton plus proton plus proton plus antiproton at rest. The energy in that situation is just your proton masses, right? So you have 4 mp c squared. The energy in the lab frame is going to be the energy that's like kinetic energy plus the mass energy which again, you have to account for relativity. So you get mpc squared over one minus your lab velocity over c squared plus mpc squared. So we can set this equal to each other using our little Lorentz thing. Which says that two frames should have an equal total conservation of our energy combined with our momentum. Um, so we can do this for the lab frame equals the center of mass frame. In the lab frame, we know that our energy is four mps. We, in the lab frame, we know that the energy is just our four protons and there's no momentum. So for E squared on that side, you get 16 mp squared c to the fourth. So I'm going to call this whole thing m rel to make this just algebra writing down easier and I'll move to the next step. Uh, 
um, with Okay, so now we're just doing more algebra. We can divide by two and then get rid of the mass of the proton and what we get is this. The total energy of your incoming proton has to be seven times its mass. The mass of the proton is about one GeV, so you have to pump in an additional six GeV, giga electron volts to that proton, slam it into a stationary proton to get your three proton plus antiproton interaction. Six GeV to make a particle that is one GeV. That is the threshold energy. It becomes more and more energetically expensive the bigger particle you want to make. Okay, so there was a particle accelerator that was very, very specifically made to be more than six GeV. It was like 6.2 GeV. I think it was Berkeley. And that was because they wanted to do this specific interaction. They wanted to make antiprotons. To make one antiproton that is about one GeV, you have to put in six GeV as the threshold. This is a very inefficient process, and the bigger the thing you want to make, the more energy it takes, which is why people want to build bigger and bigger particle accelerators. They're like, the more energy we could get in, let's make a TeV, the bigger the stuff we could make, the more interesting particle collisions we could do. Think about all the things we could learn from particle physics about cosmology and all the other types of interactions that are happening every day. I feel like the modern person who kind of likes physics has a very negative attitude towards particle physics, which is insane to me, because particle physics is amazing. It's such a successful theory. It's so predictive. You can see these plots of like these particle scatters and like every single little particle that's coming off has been predicted by the math beforehand. And then they, they make these big billion dollar projects and they're like, oh, see, here it is, we did it. And they can learn even more. And I guess like, like people put particle physics in the same bucket as string theory, which is just absolutely wild because particle physics is so insanely successful. They will predict a particle, spend 10 years building a thing, and then observe it as soon as they turn it on. It's amazing. Like, of course I understand that someone might say, I don't think it's important that we spend another $100 billion building bigger and bigger particle accelerators. And yeah, I agree with that, right? Like, if you have $100 million, you could fund small projects, and maybe it's not in our best interest to keep building bigger and bigger particle accelerators and spending all this energy to make like these tiny little guys. But if some government somewhere was willing to fund that, I mean, I wouldn't be uninterested in the results. I just, I don't understand. Where is this coming from? Where is this idea that particle physicists are just like lying in their offices? Do you think particle physicists get to keep the $100 million that went towards building the thing? The average salary of a professor is like $90,000. And I mean, that's pretty good in a lot of places, but not if you live in Berkeley. I Like, they're not getting rich off this. They're just supremely interested in the results. Like, if we build bigger particle accelerators, which again, I don't think it's the best use of our funds, but I mean, I wouldn't be mad if it happened. If we keep building these bigger things, we can learn more about like the fundamental physics that makes everything. And that's interesting. And so I just, I don't understand. Like, I feel like in the comments of my videos, people will just say these horrible things about particle physicists. Like they're just making stuff up when you can literally just sit down and calculate it and then go do the experiment. Where is this coming from? Stop it. <laughs> Particle physics is cool. I mean, you should be laughing in the comments of whoever is on Facebook posting that particle physics is bad, actually. That's a lame take and it sucks. So CERN 
and other places also make antimatter. Why do I always talk about CERN? It's fine. CERN has an antimatter factory and they make antimatter protons and they make antimatter hydrogen atoms. And I think they made an antimatter helium. I think that was at CERN. I know that that has happened. Pretty sure it was at CERN. What happens after that? Well, as I've told you, antimatter annihilates with matter. So if you make an antiproton, you can look at it and it will immediately just find a proton and go and release a bunch of energy. And yeah, so that's what happens to all the antimatter. <laughs> they make it and it immediately annihilates with a proton. You can trap it. I think the record is that CERN again, they trapped an antiproton for 57 days in a magnetic field to prevent it from finding any matter to explode with, um, which is pretty good. Uh, but usually they just let them hit the walls of their detector and explode, which I think is kind of interesting. I'd like to talk about another misconception that I specifically had about antimatter when I was like 10 years old. Do you guys remember the movie, The Da Vinci Code? I think it was the sequel, not the original. And I also get those movies confused with National Treasure. But he's got like a little like Beats by Dre speaker size thing and Tom Hanks is holding it and he's like, oh no, there's antimatter in here and he's going to explode the Vatican or something. And I always thought as a child when I heard about these experiments, like all you hear is like, if you make antimatter, it makes this big explosion all this energy is released. And so I was like, oh no, why are they doing this? They're gonna explode the earth. They're gonna make antimatter bullets and I'm gonna die because I grew up in America. And so when you hear scientists are making antimatter, you're like, oh no, please stop doing that. But like CERN makes antimatter all day. Well, I mean, whenever it's running, it doesn't run that much. But when it's running and it makes antimatter, it makes it all the time. And they just let it hit hit the hit their walls and it just explodes. And like CERN is still standing. <laughs> the explosions are not that big. Like one antiproton colliding with one proton, not that much energy, it turns out. I was gonna do a comparison from the energy of a proton and an antiproton. Like a proton and antiproton, if they annihilate completely, it means their total mass has to go to energy, right? And, and subatomic particles and all that good stuff. So that's like 1900 MeV. And I was going to convert that to a unit of energy we use every day, which is the calorie. Um, but the energy of 1900 MeV is like 10 to the minus 14 calories. So there's no food like that has that amount of calories. It's a very small amount of calories. So you have to understand that one proton colliding with one antiproton is, is like zero energy. It, it does nothing to CERN. They just let the antiprotons go and they just hit something and like the structural integrity of the building is fine. The detectors are fine. Nothing happens. It's a very small amount of energy. For some reason as a child, I was like, oh God, they're gonna blow up the world. But like their whole production of antiprotons is a very small number. So it's a very small amount of energy. It's just not that much energy. It's totally not a problem. Like if you got shot with a single antiproton, it would find a proton in your body to annihilate and you would not even notice. It's, it's really tiny. Um, yeah, so this movie is kind of funny on reflection. Also look at this device. <laughs> you need these giant magnetic fields to keep these things from annihilating with the container. Like what's in there? What's in there? How is it doing it? What's going on there? Is there a giant battery somewhere that we can't see? That's kind of fun. Why does a proton annihilate when it hits an antiproton? Why does an electron annihilate when it hits an anti-electron? Uh, it's kind of a complicated process, but imagine you have your two boys, your proton and your antiproton, and they have their quantum numbers and their charge and their mass, all of that good stuff. Now you put them together, they're moving towards each other. They, they have opposite charge, they'll be attracted to each other. Um, but they, they can overlap. 
right? They don't have the same quantum numbers because they have opposite charge. So imagine they're holding the same space spatially. Okay, now what you have made is a particle that has a mass of two and a charge of zero, right? Because it's two proton masses, plus one charge, minus one charge, charge of zero. That particle doesn't exist. That, as a state of matter, is incompatible with the standard model, it's incompatible with the universe, it's incompatible with quantum mechanics, and so immediately just energy. It just breaks apart. Uh, Einstein's energy mass equivalence, boom, energy. That's what happens. They're attracted to each other because they have opposite charges. They can't exist like this energy. That's why particles annihilate. So that's, that's probably not a very satisfactory definition for a lot of people watching this video. It, like that's true but they might want like what is the mechanism you know and that's fine I will try to go into a little bit but you know I don't like doing that I don't like talking about subatomic physics it squigs me out but I'll do it for you but first I need to talk about Richard Feynman because when you're googling around the internet about antiparticles and you're like why do antiparticles annihilate you're gonna find like a Reddit thread where someone is referencing Feynman's lectures on physics and they will say something along the lines of like, antiparticles are just particles moving backwards in time. And they will put up a Feynman diagram that looks like this. And the thing is, is you can't go back in time. This doesn't make any sense. Like mathematically, Feynman's description of antimatter matches Dirac's. They give the same results. But as we learned at the very start of this video, sometimes math gives you unphysical answers. Like in this case, where Richard Feynman says that antimatter is just matter moving back in time, because you can't actually move move back in time. It, it, this, this is a mathematical formalism that leads you astray with the physical ideas. And I know that this has happened to people because I was Googling around to see how people are describing antimatter and a lot of the Quora forums and a lot of the Reddit threads and a lot of the Twitter threads are just people being like, it's just, it's just an electron moving back in time. There was only one particle the whole time. And I just, no, that's not right. That doesn't make any sense. Mathematically, you can use this to get the answer but that doesn't mean anything about the physics. Particles, ant antimatter is not matter moving back in time. You can't move back in time. That makes no physical sense. Are you saying Nobel Prize winning physicist, genius brilliant physicist is wrong? Maybe he just like was like mathematically, this is the same thing, so it's fine. And he did not predict that people in the future would be like, haha, they're going back in time. Alternatively, it could be a joke because Richard Feynman thought that he was very funny. Uh, so maybe it's like a joke, like the same way people talk about how there's just one electron, LOL, all the electrons you see are the same electron. Like no physicist actually thinks that. It's just like a funny thing to say because electrons have to be indistinguishable from each other. Um, so maybe it was a joke. I don't think he actually intended to say that they go back in time. I really think it was just an illustrative example that people have now misconstrued as Richard Feynman saying antimatter goes back in time. Uh, I think he was saying to an observer it's indistinguishable, but it's not physically going back in time because that's impossible. But let me give you an example. If you have a gas, like in a box, that's a small box, and you put it in a bigger box, and you like remove the walls of the small box, the gas will spread all out it will move to a more entropic state. So you could say time flows forward with entropy, okay? So if you have your gas of hydrogen atoms and you put them in your little box, they start all close together and like very hot, and then they will move apart and they will spread out to the entire box and they will cool down a little bit. They will get to some steady state of, of maximum entropy. That, that's how thermodynamics works. Based on everything we know about anti-hydrogen, is that it behaves identically to hydrogen. So if we took the same experiment and we put the anti-hydrogen in a little box inside a bigger box and we removed all the walls, anti-hydrogen 
behaves with the forces, it behaves with collisions, it behaves with the conservation of momentum just the way hydrogen does. So assuming the box is also made of antimatter so it doesn't just immediately annihilate, that anti-hydrogen would bounce against each other, it would collide, it would move forward in time to a state of maximum entropy. If antiparticles went back in time, they would not do that. They would move to lower entropy, which would be unphysical. We know that antimatter does not move back in time, but also I can't believe I had to say that because it doesn't make any sense in the first place. And I know someone could respond to what I just said and be like, no, 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 antimatter goes back in time, but it follows anti-entropy. And at that point, it's just like, what's the point of that? So it, it behaves exactly like the physical world, but instead you're just calling it all backwards. It doesn't make any sense and it's just pointlessly confusing. So, so yeah, it turns out antimatter travels forward in time, just like literally everything else, because you can't go back in time because that doesn't make any physical sense. Okay. There, there is a mechanism at work here. People who do this as their jobs are not just saying, oh, they go on top of each other and that can't exist, so boom, right? So it's, it's a very complicated process of what actually happens when a proton hits a proton, but I'm going to try to explain it a little bit for you. You have your proton and your antiproton, and they move together, and these are both composite particles, right? So they're made up of quarks and gluons, and the sea of quarks that is coming in and out of existence all the time that I don't even think I've mentioned yet, it's fine. So two of the quarks will hit each other, a quark and an anti-quark and they will annihilate, okay? They will produce a gluon. What's left is no longer two protons. You have like some quarks, an extra gluon, all of that just immediately showers in a very complex process called hadronization. What results from that, like that initial two quarks hitting each other is energy and a lot of pions mostly. Pions are unstable, so they will decay very, very quickly into electron-anti-electron -electron pairs, photons, that good stuff. You can see in your detector where this happens. You get like quark jets, you get all these curves of the particles leaving and you can like figure out which particle is which. That, that's the most I can do for you. This is why we want to build bigger and bigger particle detectors if you want to learn more about this, you know, stop shitting on particle physics so much. But what if what if like an anti-electron hits a proton? The anti-electron is not the anti-particle for the proton, so it's not going to make the proton annihilate, right? That only happens when an anti-electron hits an electron. So even something like an anti-proton could hit a regular neutron, and they might not annihilate unless the, the proper two quarks could find each other. But what if you take an antiproton and you slam it into an atomic nucleus, like a big boy, like a, like a uranium or something. What would happen? Because your proton will fly right through whatever electrons are there. It will hit the nucleus and there's a heck, heck of a lot of protons in there. What if it finds another proton? It will annihilate, but only with one proton, right? But that production of energy will cause the entire nucleus to split apart. And then maybe like secondary fission could happen. You've got nuclear re reactions happening. All of a sudden you have a start process for this runaway nuclear, like to run your power plant or whatever. It's producing all this energy because you shot one proton into its nucleus. Whoa, you could have this runaway process with energy all, all from just one anti-proton. What if you used all that energy for propulsion? Has anybody thought of this? Could you like make an antimatter engine? Did I just do something? Did we just make this? Oh my, has anyone thought of this? Did I just do something? Oh my God, what if you use this energy for propulsion? Oh my God. Okay, have you guys ever heard of the rocket equation? It talks about how important the mass of your fuel is because the more fuel you have to carry the more fuel you expend carrying that fuel 
Do you know what I mean? So we have these big giant booster rockets and they're carrying this huge volume and it's just so expensive to get all that up just so you can push the mass up. And the more mass in your payload, you have to add more and more fuel. And the more fuel you have to add, the more fuel you need. And it's this terrible problem. It's like the thing about antimatter is that it's really super light compared to like its gas or nuclear fuel component, but it's like 10 billion more times more efficient. Like that's crazy. That's insanely efficient. Like that's, that's assuming that of course you bust open your antimatter and all of it gets converted to useful energy, which probably wouldn't be the case. But either way, it's still huge. And if you actually want to travel the solar system, you need to be able to accelerate. And the thing that will accelerate you is having fuel. So if your fuel is really light, you can carry more and you can accelerate more. And the thing is, is that the big boom will make you go fast. So if your fuel is very, very light, you can accelerate more. And the more you accelerate, the faster you go. And that is essential to traveling the long distances of space because space is huge. That's why antimatter is so very exciting to people. But let's dig a little more into it. Like how much energy is like a proton-proton collision? I'm gonna put up a little flow chart while I talk about this, okay? So a proton-antiproton event is going to give you the amount of energy that is in those two guys, right? 1880 MeV. We know that this is going to make a bunch of pions and the pi zero pions have a really very very short lifetime and they will just immediately turn into gamma rays and, and you, you can't usually use gamma rays for fuel. You just can't do that. So you lose all that energy. You're left with about 40 percent You've got 1170 MeV split between your plus and minus pions, which are charged, right? So if you were thinking in the future of de designing a spaceship, this is where you start designing like magnetic nozzles to push these charged pions out because all your neutral pions have, have gone to gamma rays. But if you don't act fast, like on the order of 10 to the minus eight seconds, those charged pions will then decay into muons and neutrinos. Neutrinos, a lot like photons, they're really small boys. You can't use those as like propulsion. You can't use those to apply a force, to make a thrust. So you're down to 31%, 890-ish MeV in your muons. But you have to act fast, again, because on the order of 10 to the minus six seconds, all of those muons are gonna turn into neutrinos and electrons and positrons, and more neutrinos. And you can't use the neutrinos those are gone. You started with 1880 MeV from your proton-proton collision. Now you have some electrons and some positrons and you're down to 300 MeV. 16% usable energy. So when you're designing something like an antimatter spacecraft or an antimatter rocket, you have to think about how quickly these in interactions are going to work. Can you act fast enough to use the charged pions? before they start decaying into muons and all your energy goes to neutrinos, which you can't use to do anything, or, or gamma rays, which you can't do to use to do anything. Because of our like weight to energy ratio is so huge, billions, literally billions times more than we've ever seen before, it doesn't even matter if the only thing you can use is the last 16% tied up in electrons and positrons. That'll still work for you. This is just one of the things you have to think about when you're designing your antimatter spacecraft or rocket or whatever. I found this report from the government. It's, it's on the internet now, you can just read it. And it was just someone compiling all the current research on antimatter and the outlook for antimatter space travel. And it's super old, way before I was born. It's from the 80s, oh my gosh. But I wanna share with you some of the, the designs how will an antimatter spacecraft work? So the first design for a rocket is a thermal heat exchange rocket. You have a nice little nozzle shaped rocket that looks like this. And you put in the center of where you're gonna collide your protons and antiprotons, a big giant block of tungsten. And you're gonna smash your protons and antiprotons together, which will release a bunch of energy. We assume that the tungsten will absorb 
all the photons and all the pions and it will heat up. And then you can run some hydrogen through that will then be heated by the hot tungsten and it will push out the nozzle and provide thrust. Cool. You are limited at the temperature because at a certain point, tungsten will melt. And the way you radiate heat, like if you have like a Star Trek ship, for example, and you have something like this, that is your method of propulsion instead of like warp drive. The thing is, is that if you're producing all this heat, you, you have to make a plan for how you're going to radiate it away. Like, yeah, you have a limit because you can't melt your tungsten or otherwise this thing won't work. But also, what will you do with all that energy, all that heat? You have to get it out of your ship somehow. It's kind of a complicated problem. But also notice that this is just a rocket, right? The rest of the design doesn't really matter. This provides thrust. Um, presumably you have some sort of magnetic trap that is trapping your antiprotons and preventing them from just exploding whenever you want. And you just push a couple in at a time, they find a proton, they heat up the tungsten, and you have thrust. The next one is pretty similar. It looks like this. It's a hot hydrogen gas concept where you add like a magnetic bottle to your engine. Your proton and your antiproton hit each other. It makes a bunch of neutral pions, which go to gamma rays, which you have to deal with somehow because that's going to heat up your whole ship. But the charged pions will be trapped in this magnetic bottle and will kind of be oscillating around and they will heat up hydrogen that way and the hydrogen will then provide thrust. Notice these are still using hydrogen. I don't know how they're getting around the weight of the hydrogen, but that's still fine. You need less hydrogen because you have this antimatter fuel. Your fuel still weighs way, way less. I just want to do another one from this 1985 paper. Even though this paper is really, really old, these designs are still kind of how people start to think about antimatter engines and how they would work. We're not any closer to like proof of concept antimatter engine test example than we were 40 years ago when this paper came out. Um, so it's still kind of interesting to talk about all of these ideas, but this one is the last one I'm going to show from that paper. And it's more along the lines of what I thought people were talking about when they talk about antimatter engines. You still have your nozzle, you still have your proton antiproton colliding, except this time you have a magnetic nozzle to specifically funnel the charged pions out. Like as soon as you make them, you are thrusting them out of the back of your ship, which will provide forward movement for your ship. So this is like a longer term. You don't need the hydrogen as like this buffer between your antimatter and matter and like what the actual thrust is. This is just using the charged pions as the actual thrust. Again, how are they storing the anti-hydrogen? I don't know. Still a very interesting design. This is how I think it would work if you were doing like to Saturn or something, not just like a rocket leaving to low earth orbit. Uh, just for fun, here's a much more recent example from like 2009. Uh, it's an antimatter sail where you make a sail of like nuclear fissile products like uranium and you just shoot your antiproton right into it. And just like I was alluding to earlier, you could start a fission reaction with just one antiproton. It would explode a little bit pushing your ship forward. That's kind of neat. All of these engines will always be accompanied by little charts where they're like, we just need a single gram, just mere grams of anti-hydrogen and we could go all the way to Proxima Centauri. And I just think that's kind of funny, especially because people have been talking about this for 40 years, because you can add up the total amount of anti-protons that have been made on Earth in like the 40 or 50 years that people have been doing it. And it's like on the order of nanograms. <laughs> so your orders and orders of magnitude off, like as far away as a dollar is from a billion dollars, that's how far we are from having just like a gram of antimatter to use as fuel. I recently read this article about, <laughs> about antimatter engines and it talks about how all of the antimatter produced on earth in a year is enough to power a single like small light bulb for like three seconds all the antimatter produced on earth ever could like boil a pot of water that's 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 how little we've made like if you go to the wikipedia page cern will be like 
we made, let me find it actually, Angela. In November 2010, the Alpha Collaboration announced that they had trapped 38 anti-hydrogen atoms for a sixth of a second, the first confinement of neutral antimatter. In June 2011, they trapped 309 anti-hydrogen atoms up to three simultaneously for up to a thousand seconds. And here's the thing. If you say that you trapped 309, I assume you trapped 309 simultaneously, but really they just had three at a time. And for the space thing to work, you need a gram, which doesn't seem like a lot, but the difference in three hydrogen atoms and a gram of hydrogen is Avogadro's number, which is a huge number. So it's been 40 years. We just can't make the stuff in the quantities required. We can't store the stuff in the quantities required. Like, yes, this is an interesting idea and it would work. Like theoretically, this would definitely work, but we have no way to do it. How do you do it? You can't make it. You can't store it. How do you do it? I also think it's really interesting how when people talk about antimatter engines, they talk about how like fuel efficient and like it's going to be so much cheaper. But do you remember the calculation we did earlier where it takes six GeV to make one, one GeV antiproton? That's way more. Like, yeah, in space, we're using way less energy, but we're heating up the earth. We're using like the power grid. I mean, I'm pretty sure CERN has a bunch of solar panels and stuff. And if you go to their website, they're like energy friendly. Look at the butterfly habitats, the orchids, but like they're also in the power grid and they are using all this power to make these teeny tiny boys. And if it was possible to make a gram of antimatter, it would be very, very expensive. We would be using fossil fuels to do that. It's not efficient at all. It's incredibly inefficient. It could be, some might say, the most inefficient thing I've ever heard of. The most expensive material to ever exist. Here, here's the calculation. Here it is. I, I don't have to take you through it. But um, it's like six trillion dollars per milligram. So if you need a gram, it's, I'm just Googling what's after trillion. Quintillion. It's like six quintillion dollars to make a gram. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot. No, this isn't happening. <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you. There was a little article from 20 years ago where they were calculating like if we could just speed up our production and yeah, it's, it's like quintillions of dollars. And this is from the year 2000. So like just put inflation on that. Like it's, it's not efficient if you have to make it and spend all this money and heat up the planet from all the energy you're using just to make a gram. Like that's one trip. And guys, when they say, oh, you just need one gram and we could go to Proxima Centauri, they're not talking about we make a Star Trek ship and we put 30 families on there and tell them it's going to take 55 years and they're going to go to another star system, even though we can't tell if there's like livable planets there or not. They're talking about we can make a probe that weighs 10 or 20 kilograms and that would take 50 years to get to the nearest star and hopefully we could get the data back. And that's what we're spending the trillions of dollars on if we make the thing. Anyway, people do talk about storing it, although the people who talk about the engines never talk about the storing it, but uh, hydrogen, anti-hydrogen, like hydrogen has like a magnetic dipole moment. And so you can just make a little magnetic trap, not little like on the Da Vinci Code, but like you could just make one. Here are some designs. And there are some ones where they have like anti-hydrogen balls and like these like bumper style things. That's interesting too. So like all of these problems engineering wise seem like totally feasible in my opinion, but I'm not an engineer. What do I know? But I am a physicist and making a gram of anti-protons, no, that's, that's not happening. But you can say this is how they could work. It's just, you don't have the fuel. You can't make the fuel. That, that's the issue.
I don't know if I've ever gotten a chance to talk about this on my channel, but when I think about space travel, what always like bugs me is deceleration. Like, yeah, if you had antimatter fuel, like a lot of it, like you magically made it and you magically made the ship and you're magically storing it and it's all magically working and you can, you can speed up to, I don't know, like 0.3 C, which would be insane. That would never happen. But imagine you could. Like, it would take, like, a decade to speed up that much. And then, like, oh, you can go your five light years in, like, a decade. But if it took you a decade to speed up, it will take you a decade to slow down. Because you basically just have to turn your rockets on and point them the other way to slow your ship down. You can't approach a planet at 0.3c. That, that would bust everything apart. It's like you're driving a car. You can speed up to, like, 60 miles an hour pretty quickly. And you can also slow down to zero miles an hour pretty quickly, right? You just slam on your brakes. But in space, there's no road. There's no, like, friction. There are no particles to slow you down. You have to just turn your rocket around. And if it took you 10 years to go that fast, it will take you 10 years to go that slow. And I just can't imagine people signing up for, like, 10 years of speeding up, 10 years of traveling, 10 years of slowing down. Can you imagine you start like your slow descent and it's gonna take a decade. No one ever talks about slowing down and people will just be like, oh, you could just have sails, like one of those race cars. And it's like, there's no air in space. There's no stuff in space. Like the thing that slows you down is friction, which is just the electromagnetic force, which requires like particles and space is pretty empty. You know, those, those, those probes that like NASA and other governments and other space organizations, I'm sorry, I'm an American, they'll like send them through the asteroid belt. They don't even, they don't even plan for that. They don't even have to think about, oh, we got to avoid all the asteroids because like space is just empty. Even in spaces that we think of like as full, they're empty. There's nothing there to stop you. You're going to be slowing down for decades. That's terrible. That's a nightmare. No, no, thank you. Maybe, maybe you could have a little pod and the ship could like throw it backwards and it could slow you down that way. I wonder if that would work. Did I just do something?